Okay, they close, they close the doors. That means it's 3 o'clock, and I want to give Dr. Wagner as much time as possible. But first, Virginia Taylor has a quick announcement. Super quick, because I don't want to miss a minute of this. Um, on, first of all, I just want to say on behalf of Baptist Women in Ministry of North Carolina, the biggest thank you to Campbell for inviting us, um, allowing us to invite ourselves. We invited ourselves. <laughs> And they opened their arms in su such gracious hospitality, which has always been my experience at Campbell. So thank you. And just wanted, if you signed up through BWIM North Carolina, just want to make sure two things. If you haven't gotten, you, if you signed up with us, you'll get a copy of Dr. Wagner's book, which we have for you if you haven't gotten it. And also to let you know that afterwards, and this is true for any Campbell students who are here, Afterwards in Taylor Hall, room 118, we're gonna have a reception with Dr. Wagner, very informal, but you can ask your questions and just hang out. We're gonna have some snacks because we haven't eaten enough today and before you go home. So everybody, you know, please come and join us. Thank you. Yeah, no, it, it is our delight to partner with you all and it just, it's just been fabulous and hopefully is a good model for why we should be doing things like this all the time. <laughs> <laughs> frankly. Um, I will just introduce briefly uh, Dr. Wagner, but I was also uh, requested that you have in, inserted in your program an announcement for the BWM National um, is coming on April 11th at 3 p.m. in the Student Union where there is a movie theater. We are going to watch together uh, Midwives of a Movement, and this is a um, oral history documentary of various women in Southern Baptist life who and the obstacles that they faced in their calling. Um, so we're going to watch the movie and then we're also going to have a conversation afterward in Taylor 118. So um, there is a registration just so we have an idea of food, really. Um, so please, please consider coming and sharing with us in that time as well um, as we continue to support women in their callings. And speaking of a wonderful woman who is called, uh, I won't introduce long, but I will say for those of you who were not here this morning, this is the James C. Kamak lecture series that uh, the Kamak family has supported that we do every year, um, invite um, preaching practitioners and scholars from around the world who are known for their craft. And we are delighted to have Dr. Kimberly Wagner here today and to continue. She is assistant professor of preaching at Princeton Theological Seminary, and she is going to continue to walk us through this journey of what does it mean to preach in the wake of trauma um, and also in the midst of trauma. So please join me in welcoming back Dr. Wagner. Thank you so much. It is such a joy to be back with you all. Um, so this afternoon, I, we're going to do a what I call super rapid review of kind of where we've been. Um, so if you haven't been on the journey with us, you can catch up. Um, I promise. It's the Cliff Notes version, which will make a lot of you sad that you came to dinner last night. Um, but it, it will be, uh, we'll do a kind of quick review. And then I want to get into talking about kind of some of our communal tendencies around trauma. How do we tend to respond and maybe ways to correct that and to think about reframing health and reframing the role of the preacher or the proclaimer in the midst of trauma? So does that sound like a plan for today? All right. So the very first thing, as always, I want to offer a content warning and invitation to self-care. Um, we are going to talk about trauma. Uh, we are going to talk about instances of trauma, everything from uh, gun violence and natural disasters to racism and white supremacy, historical traumas, sexism, LGBTQIA plus discrimination. I want to invite you to pay attention to your heart, your mind, and your body. Um, if you need to, please, if you are in the room, feel free to step up, get up, step out if you need to. Um, if you are joining us online, uh, the beauty of online is you can mute me. Um, and so feel free to do that, to step away, to do what you need to care for yourself. I always say nothing I have to say is more important than your own health and self-care. So please do take that invitation uh, should you need it. So um, in the book and yesterday, I try to define trauma. And I talk about how it's hard to define for many reasons. Um, most of which is that trauma, by definition, is that which we cannot grasp, right? We can't quite get our hearts and our bodies and our minds around it. 
Um, but I try to define trauma um, here as a blow or wounding of the mind, body, and spirit self, right? The whole person, even if we're only paying attention to one or two of those aspects, that occurs when a destructive experience or event exceeds a person's or community's capacity to assimilate that experience into preconceived frameworks of understanding. And I like to think of that narratively, right? That we tell stories about who we are and who God is and how the world works and how the church works, right? And when traumatic experiences happen, those can't fit into the stories that we tell. And it ends up causing what I argue is a dual impact. The first core impact is a crisis of time. Because those experiences can't fit in to the stories that we tell, all of a the sudden they become a sort of eternal present, right? Because they don't have a home. And they start to disrupt the connection between past, present, and future. Um, put another way, the past that we lived did not lead to the present we expected, and therefore it is almost impossible to imagine a future. And so one of the things that happens often in individuals and communities experiencing trauma is a sort of foreclosure of future, of future imagination. Um, and a lot of times we get very frustrated with ourselves and with our communities because it feels like we're stuck, right? And a lot of that has to do with this foundational impact of a crisis of time. There's also a crisis of coherence. Right, where one's world or story no longer feel comprehensible, safe, or meaningful. It no longer makes cognitive sense. The stories we tell no longer hold together to help us navigate the world well. And they no longer feel meaningful. Are they even worth saving? And so I want to suggest, and I suggested last night, that those two things come together to form what I call, and this is a, a Kim Wagner original word, so don't go looking for it a million other places, uh, a narrative fracture. That what happens is these pieces of our stories begin to break apart. Another way to visually think about it is that as the traumatic experience tries to fit into the story, the story no longer can hold up. And it begins to fall apart. And I'm really clear here that it's narrative fracture, right? Not narrative obliteration, not narrative wreckage. Because I want us to be clear that there are still sustainable raw materials that communities and individuals have as we think about journeying through the process of trauma recovery. Um, I talk about sometimes the image of a, a basket of broken pieces that people bring and have to start sorting through. And it's just that those pieces don't fit together anymore in the way they once did, in time or in coherence. And we talked about last night as well that this can happen at both the individual and the collective and communal level. And what makes our job hard as preachers particularly, as pastors, as faith leaders, is that we are dealing with individual trauma, usually at the same time that there is collective trauma. And the two, of course, feed each other, but they have to be dealt with separately. Right? They're, they're, just because we, we work on individual trauma does not necessarily address the collective and vice versa. And so we have this double task of attending to individuals as well as to the collective. And I want to suggest that preaching has a unique role in this. Preaching in combination. I am under no illusion preaching fixes everything. Let's be real clear. And I know I'm a preaching professor and I should argue the, the reverse. But preaching doesn't do all the work, but there is something preaching can uniquely do. And that is address the collective. Because I, if you're doing this, please stop. But I don't know about you, I don't sit there and write a sermon for each person in the congregation. That feels like a lot of work. Um, but also, that's not how we preach. We preach to the collective. And we're attentive to the stories in the congregation as we preach. But it is one of the few times and places where we're able to address collective trauma. And so I want us to embrace that, and that's what we're going to think about today. I closed yesterday uh, with an invitation, and this is where we're going to dig in a little bit more. And that is an invitation to, ex to proclaim and minister in the eschatological tension. That one of our temptations, and I, we, we talked a little bit about this even in the sermon, is to foreclose that either has to be all happy news or all terrible news. 
And I think that one of the gifts uh, that we might bring to our preaching, not just our trauma preaching, but our everyday preaching, is holding this tension between brokenness and hope. And sometimes we're going to preach far over on the brokenness, death, loss side, right? Where all we can do is hold out the promise of hope that is on the way, but we're not experiencing yet. And then sometimes we're going to preach over on this um, resurrection side, but I still want us to hold the reality that resurrection coexists with brokenness. Resurrection is important and matters because there is brokenness in the world. Are we good with the review? All right. So that's as far as we got yesterday. I think this work is really hard to do. And I'm under no illusions that the suggestions I'm making are easy. And I think it's hard to do because of three inclinations of communities experiencing trauma. The first is an inclination to return to a past, to return to that past, whether or not it was real, right? To say, I wanted to go back to the way it was. The second inclination I think that makes it hard is we have this inclination to repair and move on quickly. I just want to clean it up and move on. And the third inclination is to think that the only way we can be a healthy community is to eliminate the traumatic impact, to get it fully erased. And I think there's problems with all three of these, and I want to kind of visit each of these things separately. First is the problem with the return to the past, this desire to go back to the way things were. The first is, and this may be obvious, but there is no true return. There is no way to go back. I think a lot here of the Israelites returning from um, exile in Babylon. They could come back and stand in Jerusalem on the same street corner with the same person, and it would be different. Because they were changed. The world had changed. Their neighbors had changed. Their families had changed. I remember in, uh, I, I wrote out majority of the pandemic in Chicago. We got hit pretty hard, and so our school stayed closed for almost a year and a half. We went online. Um, and I remember during that time, we, as a seminary, decided to fast from communion. We didn't share communion online. Um, and so finally, uh, that spring, I remember we were going to have a service in the courtyard of the, of the buildings, spread out, six feet apart, masked, you know, the whole nine. And students on my online course were just so excited. I can't wait to be back together, and we were going to have communion. And to have communion, it's going to be so great. It's going to be so meaningful. So we go to the service. It was beautiful and so well done. And I turn around after the service, and the two young women who had been so excited are sitting in the back just crying. And I went back and I sat with them six feet away and said, are you guys okay? And they said, no, we're not. I said, what's going on? And they said, we were so excited, but it wasn't the same. Well, of course it's not. But what is so hard is we have a desire for a normalcy. And we've sold a certain vision of what normalcy looks like. Which leads to the second problem with this. Is that collective trauma often leads us or tempts us toward a false or untruthful memory. I think about Exodus 16 here. Um, it's the story of, of the manna, right? Uh, God giving the Israelites manna in the wilderness as they're on their way out of Egypt toward the promised land. Um, but right before they get manna, you all will remember this story, I think. Um, the Israelites, in true Israelite fashion, go to, um, uh, to um, Moses and Aaron and say, Oh, we are so hungry. And then the line is, the quote is, If only we had remained in Egypt, where we laid by our flesh pots and ate our fill of bread. <laughs> no, you didn't. I read the book. You were slaves in Egypt. You were crying out to God out of your oppression, out of your hunger. That is a false memory. There was no, it was never an all-you-can-eat buffet. This was no cruise line. It's a false memory. 
But one of the things is that, that, especially with collective trauma, is we start to invent a golden age that never was. I saw, see this all the time with churches, particularly around COVID. I, uh, I was preaching at a church that um, I had visited before. It was post, soon after they had reopened from COVID. And I preached, and it was lovely, and had a good time. And at the end, this woman came up to me. She goes, oh, pastor, I just wish you had been here before the pandemic. The pews were full. Choir, glorious. Preaching, transformational. Coffee, mwah. I didn't have the heart to tell her I'd been there before the pandemic. <laughs> and the pews were not full. And the choir, they tried. I know the sermon wasn't always transformational. I preached half of them. And the coffee was probably the same. But there's this imagined false memory. And the danger of that is that the two dangers. First of all, it's an untruthful memory. The second danger is it makes us feel like we have fallen further than we have it makes the differentiation between the past and the present feel all that much more insurmountable. And so I think that there is a problem here with wanting to, to push toward a return to the past. And so I think in our preaching, one of the things that we can do to live in this tension and to counteract some of these inclinations is to tell the truth about what has happened. To ask folks to reflect honestly about the before times. Trauma often creates a very strong boundary between before and after. And there's a way that we romanticize the before, right? And I think that there is in our preaching an invitation for us to be honest, both with the biblical text and with our congregations, that we were blessed but flawed before, and we are blessed and hurting after, right? That both those things are true. The second problem is this, this inclination to want to hurry up, repair, and move on, right? And I think there are three reasons this is problematic. The first is that I think it often leads to a kind of slapping on of a theological or emotional band-aid on what I call a wound that needs surgery. Um, we had a great conversation at lunch where somebody asked about the kind of long-term implications of, of, of preaching. And, and I, I always say, and this is something I say to my students constantly, is preaching is not a, it, 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 preaching is not a moment, but a ministry. Right? Preaching isn't something we do at once and check it off, it fixed it. It is part of our ongoing ministry, and it is the accumulation of sermons. That, that make, a, make a difference, right? The ebb and flow of talking about the trauma and then journeying through the joy and then revisiting when anniversaries come up or holidays come up or things kind of trigger our congregations. And if we want to repair and move on, if we want to follow that inclination, often what we'll do is, God's got it. It'll be okay in the sweet by and by. Just have faith. Jesus will carry it. There is core truth to all of those sayings. I don't want to down them, but they feel inauthentic in the wake of trauma, right? And they communicate that the wound should heal quickly. And it's not. It's a long journey of trauma recovery. Which leads to the second problem, that, that if we repair and move on too quickly, it disregards the winding road of trauma recovery. Preaching in the tension, oftentimes what I find is students, um, when I teach this, this preaching in the tension work, they think that it's a progressive movement. We work from brokenness to hope to resurrection, right? It's a, it's, it's a goal. That's not how it works. We work toward resurrection, and then we, we find ourselves preaching back over on the death loss, inside, uh, death loss and brokenness side. Then something really beautiful happens, and we can preach over here. And then the perpetrator's sentencing happens. Or another community experiences something like our community experienced. Or there is a new bout of loss in our community. And so we find ourselves moving back and forth. It is not a linear process. 
I remember a church member of mine um, lost his wife um, very suddenly, and I was sitting with him, uh, talking with him, and, and, and he said, I'll never forget, he asked me, he goes, Pastor, how long will I feel like this? How long will it hurt like this? And I said, well, listen, the grief will always journey with you, but it will stop being, you know, so intense and we'll start to become something that, that, that journeys with, right, an accompaniment. But there are going to be times that are going to be hard. Her birthday, the holidays, that they're going to bring that stuff up even down the road, years down the road. And he looked up at me, he goes, it's an interesting answer. He said, Google said four months. <laughs> Can't argue with Google, right? But what he was actually asking was, what is the road from death and loss to resurrection? How do I repair and move on? And not taking seriously the winding road of this. And I think our preaching, and I don't mean just one sermon here, our preaching ministry has to account for the winding road. Right? Over time which means we are constantly attending to our congregational contexts and to our communities and to what's going on. The third problem is, is that we actually can't map out a healthy, and I put that in quotes because I'm about to work on it, a healthy future without contending honestly with the past. Um, a lot of folks I know after their communities have been through a traumatic event will say, well, this is a chance for us to like throw away the old stuff, start the new stuff, right? It can be a changing point for our congregation. And I'm always like, just be careful. Because the reality is, is that you still have to grieve what is no more, right? You have to grieve the loss of a future you thought you had. I always think of the Psalm, you know, how can we sing the songs of Zion in a strange land? Right? How do we contend with the future if we don't contend with the present and the past? And so I think our inclination towards let's just charge into the future, it will become actually fruitless if we don't attend to the past. You with me? All right. All right, and this is where we're going to kind of land and transition because this is the big one to me. The problem of trying to eliminate traumatic impact. A lot of communities um, think that they can't be declared healthy until the trauma is gone. But there's two problems with that. And we talked about the first one yesterday. The first problem is trauma by definition lingers. Even after the traumatic event is over, it is trauma that lingers. I'm just going to break things up here. That's great. Um, and trauma will, will keep going, and it will revisit, and it will show up in new ways. The intensity of it will ebb and flow, right? But trauma, by definition, lingers. And so if we're waiting for trauma or traumatic impact to be gone, we're never going to be healthy. The other problem is, is that it equates health to the absence or elimination of trauma which is not possible. Because let's be really honest. Tra traumatic events, traumatic incidents, trauma itself does not line up one at a time and send save the date cards. It doesn't wait for us to contend with one incident or one experience before another comes tumbling in. Right? I think of Job and the messengers tripping over themselves to tell Job of all the disasters. One of my friends once said, it feels, ministry right now feels like that. Like the messengers are just tripping over each other to tell me all of the things that are going on. And so I think we have to take seriously that we live in a reality of compounding traumatic incidents, right? My book focuses largely on trauma from an event or an experience and a mass event. So thinking about mass violence and and natural disasters and public health crises. But the reality is they never exist by themselves. 
They're always interacting. They're interacting with individual traumas, right? Just because a mass shooting happens doesn't take away the trauma of a childhood trauma that somebody has, right? Or an experience of abuse or neglect. It interacts with other concurrent collective traumas, right? I think a lot about um, a friend of mine in Houston dealing with COVID at the same time as the ice storm. And how did those two things, and so folks couldn't be in their homes, pipes were exploding, but they also couldn't be together because they're COVID, and right, these collective traumas interacting. There's also trauma that brings up past events. Um, I had the privilege of getting to speak with the Catholic priest who um, was a priest during the Newtown shootings and buried eight of the children. And I actually interviewed him just by circumstance the day after the Sutherland Springs um, church shooting. And I remember calling him and I said, hey, how are you? And he said, I'm not, not good. And he said, that shooting brought up a lot for me, but also brought up a lot for my congregation. Because, and I hadn't known this until I spoke to him, he said, so the shooting at the school happened on Friday. That Sunday while they were in church, that church got a bomb threat and had to evacuate. And so he said it just brought up a lot of past traumatic realities, right? And we don't know how present traumas um, pull at the strings of past traumatic realities. And then, of course, we have to contend with the ongoing nature of generational or historical traumas, racism and white supremacy, sexism, poverty, immigration and migration, LGBTQIA plus discrimination, right? The ways, and this is, a, um, this is a Kim Wagner chart, and I wish that I could draw it better because I want to pile them all on top of each other, but then you can't read the words. Um, but all of these interact at each other. And here's the thing, it isn't like you're dealing with them one at a time. They combine, they exacerbate, right, they interact, and they begin to create this kind of atmosphere of trauma, and then what happens is that sometimes certain traumatic aspects get pushed under the rug when new ones show up, right? That the history of racism in the community gets pushed aside when a mass shooting happens, or individuals who are going through um, recovery after um, abuse, when um, a hurricane hits, all of a sudden that care goes to the side or gets under-acknowledged. And so we have to think, I think, about the compounding nature of trauma, the way they interact and compound. And so, to me, if we say that health can only happen when there is an elimination of trauma, we are out of luck. We're in trouble. We're in big trouble. But so many communities, and even pastors, I'll be honest, when I get to travel around and talk to pastors, I have had pastors ask me for timelines. When will this be done? When will this be over? When will the traumatic impact disappear? And it really breaks them when I say, probably never, but you, there has, so to me, there has to be another way as we live in a world with so many interacting traumas that we have to reframe what does health look like in the midst of this? Because I think many of us are steeped in kind of the restoration narrative or the classic American Jeremiah, right? It's also the uh, story of Western medicine. I once was healthy, then I got sick. And then in the case of medical, I got the surgery or I got the medicine and I am Good as new. Same thing with the classic American Jer Jeremiah. We once were a blessed people. We fell away from God. We repented and turned around, and now we're blessed just like we were before. We have this very clear kind of restoration narrative that we like to tell. But the problem with that is that means that all sickness has to be gone. All problems have to be gone in order to declare health. Put medically, 
and I know you all heard I was a science teacher before, so apologies in advance. It's the pathogenic model. We're trying to beat back the disease. The problem is the disease. Well, I want to suggest that there might be a way to reframe this. And I'm going to do that uh, with uh, a medical sociologist whose name is Aaron Antonovsky. And Aaron Antonovsky, a uh, medical sociologist, died in 94, uh, wrote multiple books. The two big ones are Health, Stress, and Coping and The Unraveling the Mystery of Health. He was an American-Israeli um, scholar, and he started asking questions about the way we thought about well-being and medicine. And he asked the question, what if we didn't focus on pathogenesis, but on, and this is going to be your big vocabulary word of the day, salutogenesis. Pathogenesis is the origin of pathogens. Salutogenesis the origin of health. And he said, I want to think not just about, and he said, it's, it's good, we need, to, we need antibiotics, we need all the, you know, but what if we reframed health as flourishing in the midst? And I want to take that and push it uh, a little more. He said there are two basic assumptions about the world if we're going to do this salutogenic model. The first is that the world is innately entropic. There's your second science word of the day. It's chaotic. It moves toward chaos. He said, look, if all we're doing is pushing back disease and calling that health, none of us can be healthy. Right? Because the world is innately entropic. The world is innately moving toward chaos. But, he argues, people have and can gain resources to survive and flourish even amid chaos or entropic forces. You with me so far? Another way to say this is he said, what if we switch the question from what makes people sick, thinking medically here, to what contributes to health? What makes people sick to what contributes to health? And to me, that is a huge question because it shifts the definition of health that no longer it is, I am either healthy or I am sick. Now we have a gradient of what he calls ease to dis-ease or health to dis-ease and that there is a whole gradient of this that exists. And this gradient of health to dis-ease allows us to declare health even amid brokenness, flourishing in the midst of chaos. And so taking this salutogenic idea, I think that it offers us a way to think about how we preach and proclaim in the midst of a world that is filled with trauma and interacting traumatic events. It helps us to refrain, reframe excuse me, the understanding of health not only as that which eliminates pain, struggle, chaos, and illness. Notice I say only. That doesn't mean we don't want to work for justice and we don't want to do those things. We absolutely do. But if we declare health as only when they're all done, we are playing the worst game of whack-a-mole ever. Right? There is no way to stop them all. And if we wait for all of them to be down to declare it healthy, we're in trouble. Our communities can't be healthy. But instead, I think we're encouraged to think about the forces and the resources that support health amid entropy, chaos, and brokenness. And that our preaching, our proclamation can model this. That the good news comes not when all evil, hard brokenness is eliminated, but when there is flourishing and life in the midst of it. Let me try to sing, not actually sing, but sing it in a theological key. I think of two stories modeling this really well. The first is Jesus' parable of the weeds and the wheat. 
If you'll remember, Jesus says, uh, to the, tells the disciples a story and says there was a landowner who gave seed to um, the servants. They went out, they planted, um, they came back in, they went to sleep. Apparently it was very fast-growing grain because when they woke up, they look out in the field and they see wheat, the wheat that they planted, but they also see weeds. And they look at the landowner and they say, did you give us bad seed? And the landowner says, no, the enemy did this in the night. The enemy planted it. And they do what most of us do. They say, I can fix this, right? I'm going to get rid of the bad. And they ask, should we go out and pull the weeds? And what does the landowner say? No, 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 no. It'll be divided in the end. But if you pull out the weeds, you might destroy the wheat. There is something I think that Jesus is nodding to here that resurrection, flourishing, health happens not in spite of, in the midst of the weeds of life. That faithful growth, that wheat is still good. That wheat is still going to be harvested. That wheat is still going to feed people. And the weeds are going to be thrown into the fire. But not in this moment. The wheat can still flourish. The other story that I think models this so well is the story of the woman washing Jesus' feet. So she comes and she breaks open the jar and pours, the alabaster jar, and pours the oil on his feet. And um, she starts to wipe it with her hair. And uh, what does Judas say? You remember? Exactly. This woman, if only she had known, you could have sold that jar for a hundred denarii and taken care of the poor. Very pragmatic. And what does Jesus reply? He says, the poor will always be with you, but you will not always have me with you. And where we tell this story, she will be remembered for honoring me. This is probably, to me, one of the most mispreached texts ever. Because it oftentimes will either excuse our tolerance for poverty, right? Or we preach it in this very kind of spiritualized way. I wonder, and I think, I'm going to make the argument, that what this text is about is not that Jesus doesn't care for the poor. Please read the rest of the Gospels. <laughs> Jesus cares passionately for the poor and the marginalized. It, it, it is a gospel for those that live on the edges, right? And it's not that Jesus doesn't care about care for the poor, but what he says is, you will always have the poor with you. There is always going to be poverty and brokenness in this world. But for an instant, this woman found a moment of resurrection, found a moment of flourishing, honored a moment of holiness in the midst of the brokenness of the world. And to me, this is the, the kind of homiletical rearrangement I want to invite us towards as we think about preaching in the tension between brokenness and hope. That we don't see it as this progressive move from brokenness toward resurrection. That living in the tension is also about reframing what health looks like for our people. And it doesn't mean ignoring the brokenness, quite the reverse. It means honoring it, attending to it, naming it, and finding flourishing in the midst of it. It's the difference between requiring flawlessness and pursuing flourishing. To me, so much, we as preachers, we want our sermons to be so transformational that it fixes everything. I know I do. I want to believe that our preaching can transform. I do believe our preaching can transform. But if I'm requiring flawlessness, my congregation will never be considered robust, healthy. But what if we pursue flourishing in the midst of brokenness?
And part of pursuing flourishing, I think, is moving to a deeper understanding of resiliency. You're going to be a little, little uh, behind the scenes look. You will never hear me talk about healing. It is a word I don't actually use when I talk about trauma. I'm OK if you use it. You're not going to offend me. Um, but the reason is twofold. The first is because I had the opportunity to sit with pastors who have um, journeyed with communities through gun violence. And I said the word healing once. And it was almost like an explosion at the table. And they said, you don't use that word. And I said, why not? And they said, because healing implies that it's as if it never happened. It's a, it, it feels like erasure to us, right? The other reason I resist the language of healing is because it kind of points to our own capacity to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. And I think too often, so I like using language of recovery and resiliency. Again, I think there's a deep theology of healing we can get into that I don't want to push to the side, but I'm going to push to the side for right now. But I think that understanding what it means to cultivate resiliency through our preaching too long, resiliency has been treated as an individual act of, of, of strength. You are a resilient person. As if it's a character gift or flaw, right? That it's a personal success. But the reality is resiliency is actually cultivated not only through individuals, but how our individuals interact in community. Communities that have resources, communities that have connection and interrelationship, communities that are able to support each other, that is where we cultivate resiliency. Helping communities to lean in, to think about their communication. And it is, resiliency is also not a capacity to move on like nothing happened. We have bought into that lie, that we are resilient when we can pretend like we're fine. Instead, resiliency is the ongoing cultivation and reliance on tools and resources that encourage health amid trauma and chaos. And so if that's the work, it's going to change what we do and reframe what we do as faith leaders and as proclaimers. Because I think for a long time, especially in the wake of trauma, we want to be superheroes. Even those of us, and I speak of myself, who believe in democratized authority and we do group think and we, the minute something happens, I go reaching for my cape. Right? We feel the need to quickly fix, to make it better, to explain it. And yet, if, if we're reframing health as flourishing in, in the midst of chaos, then I think we have to resist this temptation toward a superhero or savior posture. We have to resist this quick desire to repair and move on, or this quick desire to move forward quickly. And so I want to offer two alternative images. The first is that of a midwife. I love this image. Um, as someone who accompanies a birthing parent, right? They are people who know well what it means to usher in new life through pain, right? And they're accompaniers. They accompany the family. They're a part of it. They're an intimate part of it, but they also can't do the work for them. No midwife can look at a birthing parent and say, jump off the table, I'll get up and take 30 minutes of uh, contractions for you. I know many people who wish they would, right? But they can't do that. They can't do the work for them. And so often when we take the superhero posture, when people come to us with their broken pieces of narrative and say, hey, can you hold this for a second? They like to hand it to us and be like, let me know when it's fixed, thanks. And our temptation, because we care and we love and we want to nurture, is we take it and we start doing it for them. We think it's our job to fix it for them. But a midwife knows that they cannot birth this child for the parent. 
But what they can do is accompany them. What they can do is think about ways to bring relief in the midst of the pain, safety in the midst of the problems, right? They can accompany and they can journey with. That's a real different posture as a preacher, as a minister, than putting on that superhero cape and trying to fix it. The other image I want to offer you is my favorite uh, minor prophet, Habakkuk. So the book of Habakkuk is one of my favorites. If you haven't read it uh, for, in a while, I highly recommend it. It's short. It's only three chapters. You'll get through it quickly. Um, one of my favorite things is, unlike most of the uh, Old Testament minor prophets, Habakkuk actually doesn't have that long introduction. Most of them have, once upon a time in the land of when, when king was blah, 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 there lived a man. Nope. They get right to the point in Habakkuk, which is, once upon a time, there was a prophet named Habakkuk. How long, O oh Lord? It moves right into lament. And I love this prophet because he does not hold punches. He is angry at God. He is mad at God. He cries out that the, that, that, and he's looking around his community and people are dying and things are falling apart. And he says, justice comes back perverted. That's the language. It, everything is topsy-turvy. Nothing is making sense. Nothing is holding together. Nothing is working. And then the second half of chapter one, God kind of responds, and I'm paraphrasing here where God says, yeah, this sucks. You're right. Now I'm paraphrasing. That's not the direct quote. Um, and then Habakkuk launches right back in to his lament. Right back in. And then we switch to chapter 2. And Habakkuk, in the midst of lament, says, but I will stand at my watch post and station myself on the rampart. I will keep watch to see what the Lord will say to me and what the Lord will answer concerning my complaint. Now, I want to suggest that Habakkuk going to the rampart, that outer wall of the city, is not a place of escape. In fact, he could probably see the destruction of the city better from up there. He is still grounded in the lament with his community. And yet, he is anticipating what God is going to do. That God is yet moving, that God is yet speaking, that God is yet going to show up. And I think this is the prophetic posture we are invited to, into when we think about what it means to seek flourishing and health in the midst of trauma. What does it mean for us to be grounded in lament with our people and yet lean to see what God will yet say? And of course, God does show up with a hard word for Habakkuk, right? God says, there is still a word for the appointed time. But if it tarries, wait for it. There's no quick resolution. There's no quick solution here. But God blesses where Habakkuk is standing in the midst of lament and expecting that God is still moving. Seeking flourishing, seeking health. And I think this is the position from which we are invited to preach and proclaim and minister. Grounded in lament and yet anticipating what God is yet doing. It's the difference to me between preaching with your wounds versus preaching through your wounds. So long we have taught in preaching, and I'll take responsibility for my field here, that you are to preach through your scars, preach with your scars and not with your wounds. That you have to be healthy enough, right? You have to heal up enough so that you don't wound your congregation. The basic sentiment of that is good, right? We don't want to wound our congregation. But the reality of real life, of compounding and interacting traumas, is that we too are wounded when our communities are wounded, and we may even be wounded when our communities aren't. 
And so we have to think about what it means to preach faithfully, to stand on the rampart faithfully in ways that are not forcing quick healing. And I think that we can preach with wounds as conversation partners, as exegetical lenses, right? As ways to to enter into others' stories. But I think that is different than preaching through our wounds, which means that we can only see our congregation and the world through our own hurt. That is, I think, when it gets dangerous and we have the possibility of wounding congregations. And so I always tell folks, I encourage you to be in ministry with your congregations as you all accompany each other. But if you find yourself only able, only able to minister or preach through your wounds, maybe time to bring him back up. Maybe time to bring in a guest preacher. Maybe time to step away and get care. You certainly don't want to wound, but it's also a false truth to say that we as preachers can somehow extract ourselves from the hurt of the world and the hurt of our congregation. And I think that superhero posture asks us to do that. Instead, if we inhabit the work of midwife or the work of, of, of the prophet Habakkuk, we, we actually can preach with our wounds in ways that are faithful. And as always, I want to, I can never walk away from these talks without encouraging folks to seek support. I said, I think at lunch, I'm a big fan of the meeting of theology and therapy. But I think it's important to remember that we can get support not only for ourselves, but for our communities. So often that superhero posture tells us, lies to us, that we are the only ones who can help. We are the only people who know our community. We are the only ones who can fix it. We are the only ones who can make it better. It's one of the lies that, that um, trauma whispers, that you are uniquely hurt and you are new, uniquely responsible. That's not true. There are many people who can accompany, and it takes communities of leaders and communities of people to do that work. And so my invitation is to think about how we reframe our preaching, our proclamation, in ways that model well, both in the trauma-soaked times and in what I like to call the in-between times, recovery and resiliency, that we can establish safety. And I don't use that term lightly. I'm borrowing that from a grandmother of, of trauma theory, uh, Judith Herman who says that the very first thing anyone has to do is have a sense of safety, not just physical, but spiritual and emotional safety, a sense that it is safe to explore these hard things. And so I want to invite us not to take the posture of the superhero who can fix it all, but to move into this midwife and prophetic space so that we may better care for and nurture resiliency in our congregations. I went over time, so I'm going to stop there. Thank you. So we do have a few minutes for questions, so I'm going to open this up for y'all. While you're thinking, when you put midwife up there, I mm -hmm. had midwives for both yeah. childbirth, and I remember talking to the, my first one, her name was Susan, and um, she told me the importance of the language that in OB will talk about that they deliver the baby. And she's like, I don't deliver the baby. You deliver the baby. I catch the baby. Mm -hmm. So the difference between just the verbiage of who's doing the work and it was, but it was huge. Like just the yeah. different posture, like the not taking of that agency. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think so often we are inclined to take agency on, for and on behalf of our communities. Um, in a way that is very unhealthy for us as well as leaders and as preachers. And instead, what does it mean to accompany, to catch, to catch. the work, right? Yeah. Like to do the work alongside, to yeah. engage that. Yeah, absolutely. I love that, the difference between delivering catching and catching. And delivering, yeah. Got two over here. Hi, thank you. Thanks so much. Um, I am a, I'm not a student here. Uh, I'm actually uh, the 
Presbytery Executive and General Presbyter for Region of Southeastern North Carolina over churches. What and what I've realized, I, I, I've loved, um, I'm starting to realize my congregations are grieving, mm. but they don't know they're grieving. So it presents as anger, it presents as other things. How do you help them? How could I help them realize that what they're really feeling is this sense of loss mm -hmm. about it, various things, you know, you know, like you said, about what the church used to be, at least in their mind, yeah. but really what their community used to be. Um, I, I took this work and realized that some of my churches that are quote unquote, those dying churches are the last institution in that community. Yeah. Like the town is effectively dead, you know, died 20 years ago when industry left, but they're remaining and still mm. they're grieving, but they, how do I help them identify that what they're feeling is really grief? Yeah, that's such a great question. It's lovely to have another Presbyterian here too. So, um, no, I, it's such a good question. I, I, I often give these talks and uh, folks will say, I can't wait to go back and tell my congregation they got some trauma. And I say, please don't do that. Please don't throw that, di our job is not to diagnose them, but to invite them toward recognition. And this is to me where um, leaning into biblical texts that allow us to study grief, study trauma, study faithful and unfaithful responses to loss can be really helpful. Because, um, so I'm going to get a little philosophical here, not that I didn't already with Aaron Antonovsky, but um, Paul Ricoeur is a French uh, phenomenologist, and he talks about when we, enter, when we have stories, we take all of our bits and pieces and we enter the world of the story. And it helps us to reorganize our pieces and then we come back out. And then we get some more pieces and we re-enter another story. And it helps us reorganize. And to me, that is one of the gifts of the biblical text is that first of all, the biblical text is the thing that we have agreed to meet around. If we agree on nothing else in a church pew, what we have agreed is that this story of faith is what we meet around. Now we may disagree on its interpretation, we may disagree on a lot of things, but we are meeting here. And so a lot of times what I like to invite people to do is enter the world of the story. Because it's easier to recognize it in someone else or in another community. Um, I also call it the Amos move, right? Where Amos says, look at this, how terrible this is. And everyone goes, oh my gosh, yes. They say, look at over at these people, how terrible this is. And they go, oh my gosh, yes. I said, look over here, how terrible. Like, yeah. Um, aren't we doing these three things? Oh man. Right? That's the Amos move, right? Amos is a pro at it. It's not getting them to feel shame. It's instead inviting them to see their own reflection in the biblical text. The second thing I think is, and this goes back to the establishing safety, right? Modeling that grief, pain, mourning, is holy too, is really helpful because a lot of times we've been bought the lie that faithfulness is equivalent to feeling good, right? Um, it, it's the way the self-help culture has infiltrated preaching, right? Um, it, that, that somehow the way that we prove that we are faithful, the way we prove we're good Christians is that we're happy all the time. Right, and so to, to, and I preached on this this morning, right, to honestly name lament as holy space, right, and as a gift that we have been given and modeling that in our worship and in our preaching, I think also creates a sense of safety that I can bring my grief into this space and it is not going to be rejected as unfaithful, right? So I would offer just, those two things to start. So I hope that's helpful. Uh, thank you. Um, I am drawn to the language of resiliency for our undergraduate community. Uh, my name is Louisa. Yes. I'm campus minister, I work in spiritual life. And a lot of the work between spiritual life and campus life over the last four years has been creating and generating and moving forward well-being initiatives for the university. Um, 
that come out of our Christian mission in order to pay attention to our own well-being, in order to pay attention to your well-being, that therefore creates healthy in the communities of we which live, work, play, all the things. Um, but I am quickly running out of resources when I start talking to the community about spiritual health and well-being, mm -hmm. and that it is not punitive. <laughs> It's not good and bad, it's not, it's not um, it, but it is on sort of this spectrum from tending to neglect, which is the only language that I can come up with, but that it impacts all of the areas of who we are. Mm -hmm. And that spiritual health is not a phrase 18 year olds know or are paying attention to or know that they even have. Um, like we all eventually learn, we all have mental health along with our physical health. And so what does our spiritual health look like? So what are you reading um, that we should be reading to pay attention to some of this for our congregations? Um, but also, where, where are you going to find some of the language around thriving and flourishing and resiliency um, that doesn't get too deep too fast um, for some very basic and beginning conversations, whether it's in a congregation or, or here on our own campus? Mm, good questions. Um, I'll send you a book, some book lists for sure. But what I want to say is I think some of the best language to talk about spiritual flourishing is actually coming out of uh, folks like Richard Rohr and Henry Nouwen, um, Beekner even, that I'm actually reaching back into those things because I actually don't think we are talking about spiritual health in super helpful ways uh, in a lot of the contemporary, more contemporary, I should say, literature. Um, and so a lot of times I actually lean back into language of folks who have encountered challenge and suffering as the access for, as an access point for that conversation for uh, folks who are not, um, not as, you know, for folks who want simpler things to read, let's put it that way, or more accessible things to read. Um, what am I reading now? What am I not? Um, I am reading a lot now. Someone that has been, as a theologian, incredibly helpful to me in this work has actually been, um, has actually been uh, uh, Jürgen Moltmann, has been very helpful to me in this work. His understanding of eschatology and the crucified God has been really a powerful way for me to understand suffering in a new way. Um, I also have been reading a lot of actually womanist literature um, and thinking about how we don't glorify suffering um, and don't recognize suffering as somehow a springboard to spiritual health, right? Um, this long, long road that we've often said, like, you had to go through the storm to get to the good. No. Um, I think there's a difference between um, suffering that leads to, leads to resurrection moments and that resurrection can happen in the midst of suffering. And I actually think some feminist, and more contemporary feminist and womanist literature um, is really good about attending to that and not glorifying suffering as the problem that then leads to the, it, it, it's not as binary. Right? Does that helpful at all? Email me. I'll come up with some better, better I know, titles I, I for you. I want the list, too, and then we can give it to the students. Please. Well. Please. We have time for one more question, and then we'll, we'll move over. Sorry I talked too long, y'all. I got going. So I'm going to try to make sense of this, and if it doesn't make sense, let me know. I, yeah. <laughs> um, so something that someone said to me once that I found very healing um, for nope. the situation was that uh, the reminder that in Jesus's resurrected body, this new body that even the disciples didn't recognize, that the scars of the nails were still there, that the Absolutely. trauma mattered, yeah. um, that it was not erased. It was a part of the story and it continues to be a part of the story. And I found that um, comforting to know that my healing or my journey was not in vain. Mm -hmm. um, and was really excited about that kind of theology and was sharing it with others. Um, and the feedback I got from others was, I don't like that at all. Um, their feedback was the whole idea of Jesus is that 
all of that goes away, like that all of the wounds are healed and that you are a completely new, like my suffering needs to go away. Mm. And so how to balance that in, in pastoral care as well as preaching of um, not glorifying the trauma because I don't want to fall into that hole either of this happened for a reason or, or all Ooh. of that or harping on the trauma, but knowing that it um, it's not erased, it's still yeah. there, it's, it's a part of the story and it will remain even after resurrection. Mm -hmm. I, for me, uh, thank you so much. In fact, the slide that was the wheat in the weeds and the, um, uh, the, the washing of the feet, the third example I had that I took out because time uh, was the wounds in Jesus' hands, right? And the idea of the woundedness that even the resurrected Christ still had the marks of the wounds. To me, this is the difference between erasure and redemption, right? That, that resurrection is not about a new creation that erases the old. It is about a redemption of the old. This is where Moltmann has been very helpful to me to think of, you know, to put a scholarly name to it. But to talk about with people, what would it mean for this? What gets erased is not the, the truth of the incident, but the pain that it causes, right? The grief that, like, there will be no more crying or tears or grief. And yet Christ is sitting on the throne with, with nail scars, right? I think to me, this is where starting to explore with people the idea of redemption as compared to, um, to, to erasure, right? And, um, and the recognition that what we carry with us, and I know many people who talk about, I don't want the things I experience in this, in this world to just disappear when I go to heaven. Right? Not, not that I need a legacy on earth, but that part, all of those experiences, good or bad, made me who I am. And I don't want to get to heaven. It's like, you're now just this glowing being with nothing. Right? Um, and I think that um, the, the other place where this is explored really beautifully is actually in disability theology. And the discussions of um, uh, one of my favorite books on this is The Disabled God. Um, and uh, where it's a discussion of that, what in heaven then, if, if my disability is part of who I am, does that get erased in heaven, right? Does that get erased in the end? And I do think that helping folks think about redemption um, is different than helping folks think about erasure. And so I often journey with folks asking like, what, what makes you who you are? And what part of that can be made holy and good? Right? And where, where can we find? And I think when folks want erasure, what they're begging for is relief. Mm -hmm. Right? When folks long for erasure, they're begging for relief from the intensity of the pain. Right? And so I think acknowledging, too, that that's what they're asking for and that's what they're struggling to name. Um, one of the other sneaky things about trauma is the way it steals language, which really sucks for preachers, right? But trauma steals language. It steals our capacity to articulate clearly and well even what we're feeling. And so a lot of times it comes out as really, um, honestly, sometimes problematic theology. Some of the most problematic theology comes out of bad contention with trauma, and part of that, I think, is because of the way trauma disorients us and seeks to steal our language. And so we just start throwing out the things we wish were true, right? Or we throw out what we can. And so to help folks kind of recognize what is really going on and why they're longing for that erasure. I hope that's helpful. It does. It yeah. is. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much for your questions. Thank you, Dr. Wagner. Um, Thank you. Thank you all for being here and participating. Um, and as Virginia said, for it's 118. Yeah. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you all. <laughs>